ahead and uh, jump in here. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a really, really informational and fun session today. I think you're going to be able to immediately leverage uh, the knowledge that's shared by Angela today. Um, you have uh, come to join us today for Blender, Build Influence with the Conversational Hourglass. Uh, Angela Forbes loves solving gnarly problems, breaking them down, tussling with teammates and clients and unearthing unexpected connections, emergent patterns and leveraged points. At Aurora WDC, her work sits in the space where technology and custom research come together to support actionable data informed insights. Uh, that means you might find her building more incisive data collection systems, telling stories through data visualization, and mentoring her team. We are lucky to have Angela here with us today. Thank you so much for your time. I'm moderating mm -hmm. today, and we'll keep a close eye on the uh, chat. And uh, as I stated before, I'm the maestro of making good things happen. I stand at the interchange of leadership, product, customers, and people delivering supercharged impact. I also volunteer uh, at the uh, PMI San Francisco Bay Area in the PMO and strategy office, as well as with Black Girls Code over the last eight or nine years. Let's jump in, Angela. Sure, thank you so much. Um, and actually, before we jump in, I would love to understand a little bit more about all of you. So if you could please drop into the chat your role or area of expertise, as well as how you currently approach learning about your competitors. See if I can see the chat here. Okay. <clears throat> anyone yeah so look into their linkedin and then their personal website perfect anyone else want to jump in if not that's okay oops there you go okay yeah competitor newsletters i see okay so more coming in perfect okay awesome yeah so i actually want to slide in an extra question here um just because of the responses that I'm seeing. Um, have any of you worked with a competitive intelligence, uh, competitive intelligence group, internal or external to your organization? If you can just drop that into the chat too. No, okay, internal and external, great, you really know. Okay, that's pretty much what I expected is mostly no. Okay, internal, yes, internal, external, okay. All right, that's helpful for me. All right. Um, well, today I am going to share with you a tool for uh, guiding conversations called the conversational hourglass. Now, I wanted to ask you those questions in order to get a better idea for who in the audience might be familiar with the various approaches used in competitive intelligence. Uh, during my time bridging CI and product, I realized that many professionals have limited knowledge of the true scope of CI methodologies. Many people have access to things like desk research or open source research. Um, some leverage filtered news. We saw social media delivered through newsletter uh, systems or uh, competitive intelligence and knowledge management, early warning systems. There are a lot of those. Product teams may also seek perspective from customers or the sales field that's super effective. And so while each of these tools, right, or, or ways of collecting intelligence are, are effective, um, the insights for each of these can be difficult to organize and most often reflect the current state, so our, our, our state or our snapshot of today, versus being forward-looking. This brings us to one very, very powerful but lesser-known approach, which is called human intelligence or primary research. Uh, and not unlike investigative journalists, primary research analysts leverage source networks to collect and validate information that can only be discovered through conversation. 
These analysts use the conversational hourglass alongside elicitation techniques, and we will be focusing on the conversational hourglass today. Um, and, and they use it to help plan effective, engaging, non-threatening interactions. These interactions not only allow them to systematically collect actionable information, but also help them build and maintain extensive source networks, which include executives, key opinion leaders, and lots of other high level individuals. And it's through practice with the conversational hourglass that primary research analysts learn how to capture attention, they build rapport, garner trust, and gather some of that critical intel. They are effectively experts at having conversations. Okay. Now, I can't teach you all the skills needed to be a primary research analyst within the next 15 minutes. That would be impossible. Um, but my hope is that by the end of our time together today, you will start to think about your conversations differently. And then with a little practice, you'll begin having more effective conversations. You'll be able to deepen your existing connections and increase your influence uh, within your organization. Now, as I move through this, I do want to um, have the audience continue to engage. Okay, so when there's questions um, that I want you to respond in the chat, I will make sure to say that. Um, I can't quite see the chat, and so you'll just have to give me a little time to, to jump in, but um, thank you in advance for your engagement. Don't okay. worry, Angela, I've got, I've got <laughs> my eyes okay. on the chat. <laughs> awesome, 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 thank you so much. Okay, okay. Without further delay, let's dig into the conversational hourglass. Um, specifically, just to start, as it pertains to competitive intelligence. So within the field of competitive intelligence, primary analysts use the hourglass to form well-planned conversational roadmaps where the goal is to lead the source through an exchange that the that allows the analyst to gather the needed intelligence right at the narrowest part of the hourglass, okay? And to do this in a non-threatening way that induces people to voluntarily tell them things without ever having to ask, that is zero direct questions, analysts begin with the end in mind, but they don't begin or finish at the end, okay? That is, they hold their goal closely well, using what they know of the source to direct conversations and create space for, inform for information to emerge naturally. Okay. Primary analysts plan their conversations by first working to gather background information or that high level context um, about the source. So things like, who is this person? What might motivate them? Who are they connected with? And do we share any mutual connections? Right. So I saw someone had mentioned LinkedIn, right? So leveraging LinkedIn to see if they have any mutual connections, right, um, is one way that analysts will do this. Um, we also, or they also will consider, um, you know, what expertise does my target or service have that I don't? What might they be most interested in? And do I know anything about potential hot button topics? Okay. And once they have this information, they begin crafting the type of conversation they believe will help them achieve their goal. The best analysts use their understanding of the source, so all of that contextual understanding, to select conversational techniques, read how the source reacts in the moment, and then self-manage while updating their approach in real time. Okay, so there's a lot of self-management there. Um, and then what they do is after they've collected that intel that, that they were looking for, they'll zoom back out and drive the conversation more broadly before disengaging gently to maintain the connection. And in part, that's because people are more likely to remember questions than they are just general topics, okay? <clears throat> so at its core, the conversational hourglass is an empathy tool and a model for the structure of a conversation or even a set of conversations. <clears throat> when we apply the hourglass shape 
right? So wide funnel, narrow, right? And then wide base. So when we apply that shape to how we think about and plan for conversations, what we avoid is the temptation to jump straight to our goal without understanding the broader context our conversational partner operates in. And it's very, very important. Um, and before we dig in further, I wanna ask you another question, but it's not an icebreaker. Um, so this is not one you need to necessarily put in the chat, but I want you to ask yourself this question. I want you to ask yourself, do I plan for important conversations? And really think about that for a moment and consider what I just shared, because I'm not talking about just knowing what you want to say or what your goal is, but do you really attempt to understand how your conversational partner might think or feel about your goal, need, topic of interest? Do you attempt or have you historically attempted to understand their context before engaging them in an important conversation? Because you need to be. And if the answer was no, you know, my, my, my follow-up question, of course, is why not? And again, I just want you to think about it. Um, I expect there to be a little fear, perhaps a drive to move fast, maybe even a lack of clarity around how to understand, get information on another person's context. That's very hard to do. Um, and, you know, that's especially likely, you know, difficulty getting some of that context um, for certain internal stakeholders that you're not closely connected to. Right. And certainly, um, you know, those are that are higher level uh, in your org. OK. <clears throat> I want to start with a couple of product specific examples so you can just see a little bit more about how the hourglass is actually applied. OK, so <laughs> back to the conversational hourglass slide. Um, have you ever participated in product research and been asked right at the start, do you see yourself using X? Or perhaps you've answered a survey or participated in research that jumps straight into a number of deeply sensitive and personal questions, or perhaps abruptly ended with this type of question. Seen all of this, and I'm sure some of you have too, but none of these examples are good practice. So let's break them down. Um, and see how the conversational hourglass can actually help us. So starting with the first, right? Why should you not start product research by asking customers, do you see yourself using X? Go ahead and jump with reasons for the chat. I can't see the chat. Is anyone jumping in? Uh, there are a few people jumping in. I think they're typing right now. We were all sharing whether or not we plan conversations. It seems like, yeah, uh, yeah it seems like many people try to understand context, but they don't necessarily structurally uh, plan the conversation. It's interesting. Okay. But they do make an effort to understand context for myself. It's how people show up. Uh, and some, someone also mentioned LinkedIn as a way to get context on person's background. Yep, perfect. Uh, some of the uh, chats that we have so far, uh, Megan said, uh, yes, no question. So a binary question, avoiding it. Right, yeah. Yep. No room for expanding on thinking outside the binary. Nah, Megan, right, you're right exactly. with us. Yep, perfect. Vanessa shared, uh, they may not have enough context to form a, a reliable opinion up front. Perfect. Maribel said they may not have enough context to give a reliable answer. Exactly. So exactly. effectively, right? We with that with that question, we've skipped all context gathering and jumped straight into solutioning. Um, yes. We we, we rarely, think, if ever, want to ask this question directly. Right. Exactly. It's, it might be what we want to know, but we need to start broader and ask more indirect questions to be effective. Okay. So just to be one hundred percent clear, <laughs> this is not what we want to do. Um, I just want to uh, jump to actually, uh, well, and mention um, a, a previous blender. Uh, Becca Hare and her Women in Product Blender talk, The Art of the Question, Unlock Powerful Insights to Reshape Your Roadmap. Please go watch it. It's very good. 
Um, she says your biggest unlocks will come from looking at the customer's existing behaviors and drilling deep on what motivates them to hire products to fill those needs. And I really love that because when we think about the hourglass, right, it's broad to capture context, zero in on motivation and needs, and then broad for participant engagement. Um, and before I move on, I want to linger on the arrows. I sort of added these last minute, um, but they're important just because every conversation you plan for with the conversational hourglass, and the hourglass, again, is really just making sure you get that context before you drive to your goal, which is not natural for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, every conversation has different needs, uh, and it's easier to show once there is an example. So the, you know, hourglass that you're using for one conversation, you know, like the first one here, um, the emphasis is on the first half of the conversation. So context here needs to be gathered slowly. There's not, you know, any previous established relationship that exists and limited prior information. This kind of applies to our, our first example, right? Or you might start narrower and the off ramp might be wider, but all parts of the conversation are equally weighted. Uh, in this case, we might have previously gathered a bunch of contexts. Uh, maybe it's an existing relationship where there's a lot of mutual understanding such that the context needed for the, this particular conversation is just less. Um, or maybe it's narrow all the way through. That can happen as well. <clears throat> uh, so let's just jump to the second example. So why should you not start or end a survey with deeply sensitive questions? Drop that into the chat for me. And uh, while you're doing that, I did want to bring up uh, two of the statements. Uh, one, Tatiana yeah. said, they may not want to offend you or say, you know, sure or yes. Yeah. And then, uh, Sharita said that, uh, yes, I'm receiving feedback that my questions are not specific enough. So that's interesting mm -hmm. maybe to address. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we think about surveys specifically, among some other reasons, you know, the, some of the, the main or the main reason in, in most cases for not starting with deeply sensitive questions is because it can be particularly jarring for respondents, right? And when we have deeply sensitive questions uh, at the start, what we risk is sort of that loss of trust, feelings of vulnerability, bad response rates, skip questions. And again, when we look at the, the hourglass, it tells us broad to build trust, then into sensitive questions, and then broad uh, again to build out that, that trust and desire for follow-up. Now, we're gonna take things a little deeper. We're gonna go through a stakeholder example. Um, Influencing stakeholders might be a bit more uncomfortable, but now that we understand how the conversational hourglass works a little bit, it sounds like a lot of you are already practicing, you know, context gathering, which is great, um, but hopefully you can see how this applies more broadly to make other types of conversations easier. Uh, and we do have to be a little bit more strategic when we're talking about internal stakeholders and recognize things like shifting power balance and the potential need to influence multiple, pe multiple people or one person over multiple conversations. And so I wanted to cover a little bit about um, informal networks and within organizations. Okay, so the truth about influence in organizations is that there exists the known hierarchy, right, of potential influence and authority, right? That's, we all see that on the org chart. Uh, but there's also these informal networks, sometimes called shadow networks. I don't know if you've ever heard of that term before, uh, but you won't see these in any sort of formalized chart. Okay. And it takes people sometimes too long in their careers to understand, but it's important. With our formalized hierarchy on the left, things are very clear and visible, right? With informal networks, individuals may have more or less power than their formal role suggests that, and that influence can actually evolve over time. 
And while it is more real in a sense, the only way to discover it is truly through conversations and observation, okay? Note too that these influence webs can shift based on the decision or effort of focus, okay? So um, if you're trying to influence one type of decision, the influence web that you need to consider might be different from, an, from another uh, for a different type of decision or effort, okay? And maybe you're asking yourself right now, okay, I see this, I understand it, but how is the hourglass going to help me? Um, it's actually because informal networks can be uncovered with help from the conversational hourglass. Okay. So to achieve alignment, right, and garner influence within an organization, we need to understand our stakeholders, simple, right? Um, to, do, to do that, really, um, and to help us think through gathering that context at the top of the hourglass, we can lean on, on empathy tools like pains, gains, and jobs. Uh, who, ha who has heard of pains, gains, and jobs? Pains, gains, and jobs. I've heard of pains and gains, but not jobs. Okay. I really like this one because it's a very simple empathy tool, right? And it helps us empathize with customers, but it can also be applied to internal stakeholders. These are the types of questions that help you think through your conversational approach, like I said, with customers, but also with your in internal stakeholders, right? And who you're trying to influence. So what jobs are they trying to accomplish? What are their needs? What struggles are they facing on a day-to-day -day basis? What makes their jobs difficult, right? And then on the gain side, what makes their job easier and where do they derive support from? All of these things can help you start to plan for those conversations right at the top of the hourglass um, and then also map those informal networks. Okay. So remember what I said earlier, when we apply the hourglass shape to how we think about and plan for conversations, what we avoid is the temptation to jump straight to our goal without understanding the broader context our conversational partner operates in that's really important. So pains, gains, and jobs helps us collect and understand context while we also ask ourselves who can help me and start to be more keenly observant of these informal networks that could exist and that do exist, okay? So as we consider influencing stakeholders, depending on their position in the org and how much pre-existing context we have, we might need to start with one conversation to, to collect that initial context, have a second to collect additional context and then we're always needing to be reassessing until we feel we have that needed context to empathize with or, or guide a particular stakeholder, um, you know, as we attempt to achieve our goal. And some people stop, stop short here, right? We think we have enough context, right? But again, because those informal networks exist, right, oftentimes we need to go a little bit further than we actually have, okay? So I'm going to try to use an example to, to make this a little bit more clear. And if you have questions, please do just drop them in the chat. I'm happy to answer them as we go along here. Um, so the example that I wanted to work through here is, say you want to propose a feature based on, your, based on user feedback, um, but you work in an organization where your leadership has significant influence over the roadmap, and doesn't always listen to user feedback when making decisions. Um, I've heard of several, you know, women in organizations like this it can be very hard to operate in. So how might the conversational hourglass help you to begin, right? And I emphasize begin thinking through your approach. Okay. Drop into the chat if you have some ideas. Is it quiet? Uh, gather context um, of leadership goals. And, mm -hmm. and, and Amy, I'm thinking that that proactively is involved in that question as well. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and what kind of questions, right? How do you how do you get leadership goals? How do you make sure that they're they're the right goals and the unstated goals? We have one more too. understand what leadership is trying to achieve and what is important to them. Mm hmm which uh, uh, ties in there with the goals. Usually yeah. there's, well, at some companies, you know, I work generally at startups 
Yeah. Uh, at uh, larger companies, there's generally a secular time of the year. Uh, yeah. You know, the beginning of the year, October during budgeting time, mid-year, where you can kind of get a sense, engage goals or how they may have changed. Yep. Yep. And then there's the organizational goals, but also the individual person's goals, too. Right. So exactly. that is wrapped into context as well. And it isn't something we consider as much. Right. So when we're talking about the hourglass and, you know, maybe I haven't emphasized that enough, we're, we're, we're not only thinking about sort of getting organizational context, right, and, and how that person, you know, that we're trying to influence sits within the organization. It's also what are, what is their individual context? Goals. Exactly. And Megan, Megan mm -hmm. has shared something. She's saying, how are leaders measuring success of their business mm -hmm. or a portion of their business? So yeah. that measurement piece is, it goes, it supports what you just said not only about the uh, team's goals, the group's goals, but also their individual uh, goals. Exactly, because that's what they're held to, right? Mm -hmm. And so that matters for them. Perfect. Uh, and then Kay said, find a trusted advisor within uh, the leadership team I love and, that. and see if there are any hidden pains that they're not publicly sharing. Yes. Perfect. I love that. Yes, exactly. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it might take several conversations with different people to gather the context needed. And I love that last comment. Um, understanding the context of high level stakeholders is going to be valuable to you more than once. You know, even if you're, you say you're looking at one decision, right? If you can get that context and understand these leaders at more than just that sort of organizational level and really understand hidden agendas, um, that will be valuable. That will continually be valuable to you, right? As long as you just, update that information. Uh, so it is work, but it's very important work to do. Uh, and some questions I just included here to help you collect some of that context is, you know, do I know who on my leadership team has the most influence on the roadmap? That's not always obvious, right? Do I know how they might view this particular feature? What is behind this view? Who can help me understand how decisions are made? And who does my leadership trust when it comes to product direction? Okay. I would agree. I've seen a couple of different uh, scenarios uh, within yeah. startups. Uh, one in particular where the CEO felt as if he didn't do a good enough job to help mm -hmm. the product align with the launch. So he jumped in and created a, a, a product council across all of the groups and then kind of took the lead over product there for a while to get it started again. Yeah. Yeah, this happens more um, in smaller orgs and more often than um, I think we'd like to admit. Uh, but thank you for that. Uh, so in doing all of this, uh, we need to suspend our own egos a bit and we need to really focus on the individual and our goal and self-manage effectively. Because based on what you learn, you have to make a decision, right? You know, I can have a conversation with this person, knowing that they feel this specific way about this feature. And, you know, I'll need to make sure that the business case is clear because that's obviously what they're going to care about. Or you might decide it's not the right time to have this conversation. I need to wait. You know, maybe there's something in the leader's personal context, right, that is making them less receptive. Uh, <laughs> There's also, of course, you know, it seems as though the person most likely to influence this decision trusts the engineering manager. Start again with focus on the engineering manager because you want to influence the person who's going to influence the person, right? That can affect your end goal. Okay. So we're always, we always have to be thinking, you know, what do I want them to think? What do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do? Just to help guide some of, some of that direction, right, towards where we actually need and want it to be, okay? Hopefully this has helped you think about conversations a bit differently. It sounded like a bunch of you understood, you know, that context is, port is important, but again, organizational as well as individual um, context really paints that picture. I wish I had the time to teach a bit about elicitation and more conversational guidance techniques. That is a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, but, but reviewing those questions, you know, what do I want them to think? What do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do should help 
Um, if I went into conversational techniques, we'd have, uh, um, we'd need an hour at least. Um, I think at this point, just looking at the time, um, we want to be jumping into the um, blender. Hi, Angela. Hi. <laughs> we were having such a great conversation and we were just about to- I was to hearing a good one. I'm yeah, sorry. You, you were absolutely right that, uh, you were absolutely right that this is a 20 to 30 minute. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, hopefully everyone got my contact information. Please feel free to follow up. Okay, great. Did you want to post that again? Uh, my contact information? Yes, the last slide. Yeah, sure. Let's see. There's probably a more effective way to do this, but I think if I pop out, I risk losing the hop in <laughs> platform, and I'm a little nervous to do that. I ended up popping out, and I was so proud. Yeah, I popped out accidentally, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Adriana is uh, she's thanking us, and she also she also made sort of a, a last comment that I thought was interesting. She said, "In meeting people where they are, there is always common ground oh, yeah. that can be found," and I agree with that as well. Yep, absolutely. Do your research on people, see what they're interested in, find that common ground, and that makes connecting so much easier. Thank you, Kay. Kay dropped your LinkedIn and your uh, email. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Please follow up. Yep. And as a as a lasting point, if there, you know, this is a, a network here, a supportive network. So if there's something that uh, that you need help on uh, within your network, please feel free to reach out to the other people in the chat. That's why we encouraged you all to fill out the profiles so you'd know how to find one another. Um, and it looks like, too, Nick has dropped her LinkedIn. And so feel free to connect. Find out if there uh, is something that you can do for the community as well as uh, what the community can do for you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you.